Thank you for coming this evening. If you would please take your seats, we will begin. Please take your seats and we will begin the service. Please turn to song 129, Rock of Ages, song 129. Song 129. <laughs> Song 372, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. <clears throat> Song 372. <laughs> Thank you. 
6.30. Wednesday nights at 7 is our Bible study, and tonight we're doing a Bible study on the Trinity. And uh, we've got the soul winning times listed there below, as well as salvations and baptisms. Is there anybody who needs to be baptized tonight? Go ahead and put up your hand if that's you for baptism uh, so that we could get the water flowing for that. Okay, now put it back up if you need a bulletin. And then um, uh, across the page there, we got the note about the Father's Day root beers. That already happened. We've got the curriculum exchange there. And then uh, on the back, we've got uh, the note about the, the meeting for the current and prospective cleaning volunteers. So that's what you see set up over here. So if you're one of the people that normally cleans the building, then uh, this is sort of a little appreciation deal for you. Or if you're just interested in, you know, finding more about, out more about volunteering to clean the building, there's going to be a meeting over here with some special food for that crowd. So uh, if you are a member of the cleaning crew or if you just want to start helping out cleaning or you want to at least explore that possibility, you know, because the food smells good, then uh, you're welcome to join the, the cleaning crew meeting over there after the service. And then uh, we got the Bible memory passage, Psalm 93. Who's working on this so far? All right, very good. Who's caught up, meaning you got verses 1 and 2 already done? 1 and 2 are done. All right, great. So keep it up with that. Just a short little passage. And then uh, other upcoming events. The, the big thing is Albuquerque. We had the sign-up sheet out. Uh, the sign-up sheet's not here right now. But if you, uh, is there anybody who did not sign up yet and you'd like to sign up to get one of those hotel rooms for Friday night for the Albuquerque trip? Okay. God bless you. I see that hand. Well, this is the wrong kind of pen. All right. And then is there anybody else who needs lodging for the Albuquerque trip? And then is there anybody who has signed up for the Albuquerque trip and you're, you're no longer going to be able to make it? Okay. I think I already got you. Anybody else that's not going to be able to make it that thought they were coming? All right. Very good. So I'll take care of that. And then uh, are there any questions about the Albuquerque soul winning trip? Or does everybody have a handle on what we're going to be doing? Any questions about the trip? Are you, uh, are you driving yourself? Who are you riding with? Did you get signed up on the church van? Okay, the church van is leaving from here at 5 o'clock sharp on Friday evening. And Brother Chris Segura is going to be your driver. So you can talk to Chris about the details, but it's going to leave. It's going to roll out here at 5 o'clock sharp. And it's got to be 5 o'clock sharp because it's already going to be a long drive. So, yes. The other what? Where, where are we going? Well, I didn't book the hotels yet since, since our deacon was trying to split the church. So I, I decided to wait and see, you know, who'd been infected by his heresy before I booked everybody's hotels. I knew, I knew your hotel would say booked, but I just, you know. <laughs> I didn't want to sit here and I didn't want to sit there and go down the list and try to figure out, like, is this person for sure, you know, going to say? So anyway, um, any other questions? But I'll, 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 I'll email you or text it to you. We'll get it to you in time. You're going to have to have faith to just wait till the last minute to find out your hotel option there. But just trust that it's going to be there, right? Anything else for any other questions? Yes. Okay, that's a, that's a great question. Um, it's always good to just have your own little personal stash of materials, but we will bring boxes of materials ourselves for sure. So the church will bring some boxes, but if you want to bring your own little stash. So Brother Segura, I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to load up some materials into the trunk of the church car. You want to just load up, load up a couple boxes? All right, so yeah. Yeah, we'll bring, bring a, you know, probably 2,000 YouTube cards. And then we'll bring a lot of DVDs and stuff like that. Any other questions about Albuquerque? All right, very good. And then let me just address what's going on, the situation with Tyler Baker. He's been fired from his position as a deacon of this church. And it's over some very serious things, the most serious of which is the fact that he rejects the doctrine of the Trinity. And not only does he believe a false doctrine, and uh, that, that denies the Trinity, which is believed by all of evangelical Christianity, not just by independent Baptists, but by all Baptists, Southern Baptists, all types of independent fundamental Baptists, even Calvary Chapel, Bible Church, 
community church, non-denominational church, Presbyterian church, Lutheran church, is believed by all of evangelical Christianity. He rejects the teaching of the Trinity and has gone into this heresy of the Pentecostal oneness doctrine. And not only that, but I found out that he's been teaching that doctrine to people around the church for over a year now. And it's been very selective. It's like he just takes certain people aside. He, it's funny, he never brought it to me, never brought it to Garrett, never brought it to Brother Segura, never brought it to Paul Wittenberg, never brought it to people who've been here a long time. It's, it seems like he was targeting people who are newer in the faith, newer believers or newer to our church, just people in his very tight-knit circle. And a lot of people have been coming out saying that he approached them with this false doctrine. And let me tell you something, the Trinity... And I just want to make this crystal clear. The Trinity is not an optional doctrine for us Amen. in this church. It's not, a, it's not a side doctrine. And look, there are a lot of things that we could agree to disagree on, folks. You know, different interpretations here and there. And even the Trinity itself is, you know, the Bible says, great is the mystery of godliness. So people might have slightly different views or maybe they might use a different illustration to explain it. But to sit there and go into this oneness doctrine, this modalist doctrine, and this garbage that has been rejected by all of evangelical Christianity, all Bible-believing Christians, every type of Baptist, and to bring in this kind of garbage is not acceptable. And I just want to tell you right now, and I know there's a lot of people that he approached with this, because, I mean, people are coming up. Somebody just came up to me today, again, like, oh, yeah, he approached me with it, too. Yep, he tried to teach that to me, too. I just want to make this crystal clear right now. If, if that's what you believe, if you believe in that oneness doctrine, if you believe in that modalist doctrine, then you will be thrown out of the church. It's that simple. Because we can't, this is a cancer that's been spreading. It's a problem that's been there. In our, and I didn't know about this. I just found out about this on Monday at noon. Thank God somebody told us. Because we would have sent him out. And then he would have started preaching this stuff and baptizing differently and all. And we would have had to declare him a heretic. It would have done a lot more damage. It's a lot better to figure that out before he gets out there and, and starts the church. And who knows what other kind of weird junk he's going to be preaching if he's going to teach this, this modalist garbage. And, uh, you know, if you don't know what I'm talking about, well, stick around for the sermon because I'm going to be teaching this from the Bible, proving it from the Bible. It's a milk of the word doctrine. I said on Sunday night I was preaching the meat of the word. Well, tonight I'm preaching the milk of the word. I'm going to be preaching a very basic sermon from the most basic book in the Bible. I mean, what's the book that you tell every uh, new believer to read? John. Hey, start in the book of John. Start in the gospel of John. And when they go evangelize the deepest, deepest, darkest tribe of Africa, what's the first book that they translate in that language? The gospel of John. It's the most basic beginner book of the Bible, you know, I can debunk this oneness garbage with 65 books of the Bible tied behind my back just with the book of John alone is enough to put this thing to bed. And so I just want you to know if you're part of this faction that's been spreading this stuff, uh, you know, you better just hit the road, Jack, because we will not tolerate that heresy. We will mark and avoid people who are trying to bring in a strange doctrine and so forth. And look, there have been other problems with Tyler Baker. His work performance has been, you know, mediocre on the best of weeks, C minus on the best of weeks, but lately in the past few months, his work performance has gone way downhill. Don't take my word for it. Ask his coworkers that work with him every day. Ask Brother Segura, ask Garrett Kirschway, or ask anybody else who's had to work with him. He's lazy, he's not doing his job. Instead, he's sitting around dreaming up heresies, He's trying to split the church by going around teaching all this heresy and then telling people, come to Jacksonville so that they can hear the true doctrine of the nature of God, oneness, not the Trinity. And you say, well, you know, is it really that big of a deal? Well, just go on Wikipedia and type in non-Trinitarianism and it will list you every denomination that doesn't believe in the Trinity. In fact, I'm gonna, uh, let's do it right now. Who's got a smartphone I can borrow? Because mine's live streaming. Somebody help me. Somebody that's not sitting all the way in the back. Here we go. Got, got a smartphone for me. And if you, everybody turn in your smartphones to, uh, <laughs> turn in your smartphones to Wikipedia 
if you would. And I, I just think I, I, this is so important. This is such an important point because a lot of people might just think, well, why does it matter? It's not a big deal. And they don't understand how grave this error is of rejecting the doctrine of the Trinity, which strikes at the very core of who Jesus is and who God is. But I'm just going to type into this isn't my phone, so i got to figure out how to use it here. Non-Trinitarianism is what I'm looking up in Wikipedia. And this has a list of who rejects the Trinity, okay? It says right here in the third paragraph, we'll start in the first paragraph. Non-Trinitarianism refers to the belief within Christianity that reject the mainstream Christian doctrine of the Trinity, the teaching that God is three distinct hypostases or persons who are co-eternal, co-equal, and indivisibly united in one being or essence. Certain religious groups that emerged during the Protestant Reformation have historically been known as anti-Trinitarian. Look at the third paragraph. In terms of number of adherents, non-Trinitarian denominations comprise a small minority of modern Christianity. By far, the three largest non-Trinitarian Christian denominations are the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Iglesia Ni Cristo. There are a number of other smaller groups, including the Christadelphians, Christian Scientists, Dawn Bible Students, Living Church of God, Oneness Pentecostals, Members Church of God International, Unitarian Universalist Christians, The Way International, The Church of God International, and The United Church of God. Now here's my question. Who on that list is even close to being saved? Even remotely close to being a Bible-believing Christian on that list? Anyone? None of those. These are all cults and hardcore, holy roller Pentecostal churches, every last one of them. And you say, well, why does that matter? What's that prove? What, it's what the Bible says. Hey, because there's a person known as the Holy Spirit who lives inside of every believer. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to guide us into all truth. So if millions and millions and millions of believers are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, how can they all be wrong about who God is and who Jesus is and then a bunch of unsaved holy rollers are the only ones who have it right? A bunch of oneness Pentecostals and apostolic and Church of God International? Also, you expect me to believe that the Holy Ghost can't lead all of Christians, but he just picks one lazy employee at our church and guides him only into this truth and his three or four people that he's indoctrinated with this. And the reason why this is so important to understand is that you need to understand that if you're the only one who believes a major doctrine, you're wrong. Because the Holy Spirit's not unique to you. The Bible is not unique to you. And that is how cults get started. Because a cult starts when somebody says, everybody else is wrong. I have a unique truth. That is a cultic mentality. No Major doctrine, nothing that's a big doctrine that we preach should ever be unique to us. Yeah. Or, or, un, or, or say, well, only uh, there's unsaved people who believe in it, but all Christians reject. Look, there are 6,000 independent fundamental King James only Baptist church in America. They all believe in the Trinity. There are about 3,000 others that are not King James only, but they're independent fundamental Baptist. And you know what? They all believe in the Trinity. I think there are about, what, 18,000 Southern Baptist churches or something like that, and they all believe in the Trinity. The Lutherans believe in the Trinity. The Presbyterians believe in the Trinity. Every Bible church, every non-denom church, every Calvary chapel, every, I mean, are you going to tell me that this one person has this unique revelation of, oh, the Trinity is false? I don't believe that for one second, and that's a scary mentality when people think, that they can come up with strange and new doctrines and, and that we're supposed to just accept it. And you know what? I'm not going to be carried about with every wind of doctrine. This church is not going to be carried about with every... Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. And mark them that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine that you've learned and avoid them. And anybody who's peddling this heresy in this church will be marked and you will be avoided. 
and you will be put out of fellowship. This is not a, a small thing. It's a huge thing. And, you know, even the, the way that we baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, well, that's not correct, according to this oneness doctrine that, and, and, that Tyler Baker, Rick Martinez, and Elliot Ray have been going around teaching. Those three, there's your evil trinity right there. <laughs> Rick Martinez, Elliot Ray, and Tyler Baker have been going around and teaching this oneness doctrine only to certain people. And I talked to all three of them, and all three of them are unwilling to accept the teaching on the Trinity. Unwilling to repent. I talked to them, and, I, and they said they're not going to change on it. And that's, and I, you know, I, I, I'm tempted to just go into my sermon, but we need to sing a couple more songs and pass the offering plate, and then I'm going to come back and go into the sermon and I've got, four, I've got four pages of Bible verses from the book of John alone that disprove this oneness teaching, this modalist teaching that rejects the Trinity. And I'll explain why it's so important and, and so on and so forth. But before we do that, let's sing our Psalm of the Week. <laughs> psalm 67. And uh, I don't want to, I, I kind of stealing my own thunder here. So let's sing our Psalm of the Week, Psalm 67. to John chapter 14. John chapter number 14, as we always do, we'll read the entire chapter, beginning in verse number one. You can follow along silently with Brother Jesse as he reads. John chapter number 14, starting in verse number John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may also be. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, shew us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? 
He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, shew us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you ask, you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may, may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he, he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. Brother Dominic, will you pray for us? Dear Holy Father, we just want to thank you and give you honor and praise you. Giving us opportunity to be gathered together in your house tonight, Father. And we just pray that you fill past with the Spirit. And let our ears be edified and we say in your name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's turn back to John chapter 1, verse number 1. John 1, 1. The title of my sermon tonight is Pentecostal Oneness Doctrine Debunked. Pentecostal Oneness Doctrine Debunked. Debunk. Now, what does that even mean? Let me just start out by just basically explaining what the Trinity is and what this Pentecostal oneness doctrine is. Uh, these three heretics in our church that have been going around and subverting us, not being uh, open. You know, when people do that which is right, they do it in the daylight. They do it openly. But men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So they go to just certain people, they take them aside, somebody else walks up while they're having the conversation and it's kind of, shh, shh, you know, they quiet it down. They only approach certain specific people with this. But what they're teaching, I'll give it to you in the wording that one of them worded it to me. They said, well, the Trinity, it's sort of like a one-man band. So, you know, you got a guy who's playing a, a guitar and a drum and a harmonica all at the same time. That's the Trinity, you know, one spirit, one guy, one entity, and he just plays three different parts, three different roles. Other people who believe this modalist doctrine or oneness doctrine will explain it as, you know, sort of like I'm a husband, I'm a father, and I'm a pastor, three in one. And then they say that's the nature of God, that he's just one person, one spirit, one entity who just wears different hats, you know, like the old movie or something where the guy puts on the police hat and then he t in the small town and then he takes it off and he puts on the fire hat and then he puts on a black hat and he says, now I'm the mayor of the town and everything like that. That's what the oneness doctrine teaches. 
okay? That God just plays these different roles. He manifests as the Father. He manifests as the Son. He manifests as the Holy Spirit. He can even manifest himself in other ways. Those are just his three main manifestations. That's the oneness doctrine. Whereas the Trinity teaches, and of course the famous verse, 1 John 5, 7, comes to mind. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And what the teaching is with the Trinity is that these three entities, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, are distinct from one another, but collectively they make up one God. So one God composed of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and that these three are one. That's what the, the, the basic traditional view of the Trinity is. And people will use different uh, illustrations to illustrate it, and no illustration is ever going to be perfect. But, you know, some people will use an illustration of, of water being, you know, ice and water and steam, and but it's all H2O. Or some people use an illustration of the body, the soul, and the spirit, but it's all you know, the same person. That's one illustration that people will use. And, you know, no illustration is perfect. They say like an egg has like the yolk and the shell and the white of the egg, but it's just one egg and stuff like that. It has three components. So people use a lot of different illustrations, but obviously we don't want to base our belief on illustrations. We always want to base our belief on what the Bible teaches. And what the Bible teaches is that Jesus is God, but that Jesus is not God the Father, God the Father is different than the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is different than the Son of God. The Son of God is different than God. The, they, they, but they all make up one God. And you say, well, that's confusing. I don't understand that. Here's the thing. The Bible does say great is the mystery of godliness. So it's not something that we can necessarily fully wrap our mind around, but we have to believe that there's the Father and there's the Son and there's the Holy Ghost. These three are one, but they are not the same as one another. And look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove it to you from the Bible. I have four pages of Scripture just from John. But let's just start in John 1.1. 1, 1. And remember, as we go through the sermon tonight, John is the most basic book in the Bible that we give to every babe in Christ and say, start here. That's pretty much universal. Go to John chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible reads, In the beginning was the Word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So who is the Word? Jesus, the only begotten of the Father. He came and He dwelt among us. Now, Jesus, the Word, the Bible says, He was in the beginning with God, and He was God. Now, how can he both be with God and be God both at the same time? Okay, well, think about it. From a Trinity perspective, if we say, okay, God is comprised of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, then when the Bible says the Word was with God, we're referring to God the Father, because God the Father is often in the Bible just called God. So he was with God, but he also was God, because of the fact that he is a member of the Godhead. So he is, he's with God and he is God. Look at verse 18. The Bible says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now when the Bible says, No man hath seen God at any time, we're clearly talking about God the Father. We're clearly not talking about Jesus. Because did people see Jesus? Of course they did. So when the Bible says no man has seen God at any time, but then it says the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. But you say, well, does this mean that Jesus isn't God? Well, okay, let's start over. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This doesn't take away from the deity of Jesus Christ. Of course Jesus is God, but he's also with God because there's a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, if we were to take a oneness interpretation or a modalist interpretation, this wouldn't make any sense because it would just say, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was God and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and he put on that other hat, he put on that other mask or he put down the guitar and he picked up the harmonica or whatever, but that is not what the Bible teaches. 
Now let's go to chapter 5 of John. We got a lot of scripture. I don't want to get too bogged down in chapter 1. I want to hit a lot of scripture tonight. I got four pages. I want to get through all four pages, let alone the rest of the Bible. Amen. This is just the book of John. But look at John chapter 5, verse 22. It says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Okay, now the modalist is going to look at that. The oneness, Pentecostal, is going to look at that and say, Well, that's just because when he does the judging, he puts on the, the Son outfit. You know, he puts on that mode. He, he, he's in that mode. When he's as the Son, that's where he does the judging. Okay, all right, well, let's go down to verse 30, though. Because the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. That sounds like there's a big distinction there. But look at verse 30. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. That shows right there that the will of the Father is different than the will of the Son. What the Son wants to do is not the same as what the Father wants to do. That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, Not as I will, but as thou wilt. Not my will, but thine be done. Why? Because there's a difference there in what the Son would want to do versus the Father has a will and he has obedience to the Father and he submits himself to the will of the Father because there's a chain of command there. The Father... And look, I, I keep wanting to quote all these verses from Corinthians and all this, but I, I said I was going to do it just from the book of John. I'm going to save all those for Sunday morning, the whole rest of the Bible. But anyway, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Watch this. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth, beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Verse 37. And the Father which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Now, how can you get any clearer when he says, hey, if I'm bearing witness of my own self, my witness isn't true. Well, guess what? If modalism is true, if the oneness doctrine is true, he is bearing witness of himself. If he is God the Father, that's not two. That's one witness. And he says that the Father, he has borne witness of me, the Father himself. He said at the end of that verse, in verse 37, you've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you for whom he hath sent, him you believe not. Now go to John 6, 46. John chapter 6, verse 46. John chapter 6, verse 46 says, Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. He's referring to himself there. He's saying, I've seen the Father. But no human being has ever seen the Father. The Bible says in chapter 8, flip over to John chapter 8, verse 16. John chapter 8, verse 16, and this ties in with what we just read in chapter 5. John chapter 8, verse 16, And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone. I'm not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Amen. Hello, is anybody home? Yeah. It's written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I'm one that beareth witness of myself. And the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. I mean, what if I said, you know, I mean, it's just insane. Like, well, I bore witness as the pastor, and I bore witness as a father, and I bore witness as a husband. What else do you need, Your Honor? He's going to say, no, that's one person. That's one guy. But Jesus said, no, no, I'm not alone. I'm bearing witness of myself and the Father He's bearing with. Are you starting to understand why all of evangelical Christianity understand, understands this doctrine? It's starting to make sense why every Southern Baptist church, every independent Baptist church, every non denominational, you know, quasi evangelical church, every Lutheran church. I mean, are you starting to understand why this doctrine is believed by all of evangelical Christianity? Let's keep going. Verse number 26 I have many things to say and to judge of you. But he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. 
They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When you've lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. I'm not doing it by myself. I'm not doing it of myself. The Father which sent me taught me these things. Verse 29, And he that sent me is with me. Again, that's just like John 1, 1. He was with God, and he was God. He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him, right? So if the, if the Son has a will and the Father has a will, what are we going to do? Always the things that please him. He did always the things that please the Father. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Look at verse 42. Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself. But he sent me. I mean, how can you read all this and say, oh, oneness, modalism? It's crazy. Go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And here in John 10, 30, this is one of the verses that would be used as a proof text by the modalist, by the oneness Pentecostal type doctrine. They would point to John 10, 30 and say, there it is right there where he said, I and my father are one. But here's the thing, we already knew that there's three that bear record in heaven and that these three are one. No surprise there, but let's keep reading. Let's actually get the context. Verse 30, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy and because that thou being a man makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said ye are gods? If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe me not, believe the works, that ye may know that and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. Now I want you to pay close attention to that statement there where he said, the Father is in me and I in him. You got that? We're going to come back to that in a little bit. Go to John chapter 12 because I'm going in order. We're going to come back to that when we get to John 14, but I'm, I'm moving in order from chapter 1 forward. So let's go to John chapter 12, verse 49. The Bible says, for I've not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Now look, if Jesus is God the Father, how could he just start up, well, I have not spoken of myself. I didn't come up with this stuff myself. I got this from the Father that sent me. John chapter 13, verse one. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. So, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Jesus said that in, in John chapter 3, the Father loveth the Son. He says throughout the book of John, the Father sent me. He says throughout the book of John, I'm going unto the Father. So if the Father sent him, if the Father loves him, if he's going to the Father, how can this all be himself? And he uses the word myself over and over again to say, I'm not, I didn't send myself, I didn't command myself. We're not talking about, we're talking about the Father. So how can he be talking about himself or talking to himself as they claim? Yeah, he's talking to himself. When he prayed, he talked to himself. That's what one of these heretics told me. They said, well, of course, I mean, if Jesus is God, he's talking to himself. Well, no, because if you actually understood and believed the Trinity, you'd understand that the son's talking to the father. He's not talking to himself. Did he, what, what does the Bible say? Look up the word myself there. What's it saying? Saying, no, I, I'm not speaking of myself. I didn't send myself. I didn't command myself. I'm bearing witness of myself, and then also the Father's bearing witness of me. There's a relationship there, isn't there? When the Father loves the Son, 
right. Father sends the Son. Son returns to Father. Son does the things that please Him. <clears throat> the Bible says in John 14, 6, here's where we get into some really famous scripture here. A little more of a, a proof text that the, the oneness doctrine would lean on, the modalism doctrine. It's called modalism because it's like uh, one entity appearing in different modes, father mode. You know, like on an electronic device, you'll switch into various modes of operation. That's why it's called modalist because it's, you know, father mode, son mode, Holy Spirit mode. And they'll say, well, we're not modalists because we can believe in more, he can be in more than one mode at the same time. Yeah, but that's what all modalists believe. That's what all oneness Pentecostals believe, that he's in more than one mode at once. So it's either called one Pentecostal oneness doctrine or it's called modalism. These three heretics said, well, it's not oneness. And then they start describing it to you and it's identical to what the Wikipedia page for oneness teaches. <laughs> and here's what I'm asking myself. If it's not oneness, if it's not the modalist, if it's not the Trinity, so what is it then? Oh, it's a new doctrine. So what kind of a cult are you starting? And what are you going to name this new doctrine since you don't like any of these names? What are you going to call it? Tylertarianism? <laughs> Look at John 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you'd known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. G Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? So this is their proof text. One of their, they, there's only a handful. I could count on one hand their proof text. And we got together last night at the preaching class with 30 of us men and we went around the room and we all racked our brains and, and a lot of them had already been talked to and taken aside by these guys and we went through and we could hardly come up with just a handful of proof texts and they're so easily debunked and this one's no exception where, where he says, well, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father and they say, case closed right there. Okay, but let's keep reading. Why don't we read the context, shall we? Let's not just rip this out. He said, how sayest thou then show us the Father? He explains why in verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Now, if modalism were true, wouldn't this be a perfect opportunity for him to just say, believest thou not that I'm the Father? Be a perfect opportunity. But he says, believest thou not that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. I speak not of myself. Oh, he's talking to himself. No, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Now, let me ask you, and, and there's a lot more in this chapter that we're going to look at. But let me ask you this. Is the Holy Spirit in you? Does that make you the Holy Spirit? No. So if I say the Holy Spirit's in me, or if I said Christ in you, the hope of glory, or if I said we're in Christ... If any man be in Christ, right? Mm -hmm. If Christ is in me and I'm in him, does that mean I'm Christ? Mm -hmm. But yet, supposedly, the fact that Jesus said, well, the Father's in me and I'm in him, somehow makes Jesus equivalent to God the Father? No way. Let's keep reading. It says in, uh, where do we leave off? Somebody help me out. We read 10. Okay, let's look, at, let's look at verse 11. Believe me that I'm in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I'll pray the Father... And he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. So right here, well, what do we see? All three members of the Godhead in one verse. Because Jesus is talking, the Son is talking, and he says, I'll pray the Father, and he'll give you another comforter. Who's the comforter? The Holy Spirit. So you got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost right there. It says in verse 17, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. 
I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Now stop right there. Here's another proof text for the oneness, the, the modalism. They'll say, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And then they'll say, see right there, that shows that the comforter and Jesus are just identical. You know, there's, they'll, they'll try to make no distinction between the two. You know, but stop and think about, and you know what, who, who was it, which of the twins was it that shared this with me? Because we were, which one was it? Who gets the credit? Jesse? All right. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, you know, because we were talking about this, and we were going over this, and, and, and Jesse had a great point about this because he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. That's because after the resurrection, after he ascends to the Father, he comes to them. And he gives them the comforter because he breathes on them and he says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Think about that. So when he says, I, you know, I'm going to give you another comforter. I won't leave you comfortless. I will come to you. He's not saying I'm going to come to you in the sense of I'm the comforter and I'm going to come to you. No, he's saying I'm going to send the comforter. I'm going to come to you because if you get to the end of the book of John, what happens? Jesus comes to them and breathes on them, and they receive the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. So it's pretty easy to understand. Uh, thanks to Jesse. Uh, verse, let me, let me turn there to uh, verse 20. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. So let me ask you, are we God the Father? Well, yeah, because, I mean, if he said, I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me, I guess that makes us the Father, too, because he's in us and we're in him, right? Wrong. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Look at verse 24. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine. It's not mine, but the Father's which sent me. But supposedly Jesus is God the Father? How does that work? That's why, I mean, look. Ask Brother Segura. Brother Segura sat right there next to him. My wife was sitting right there when he said, I believe that Jesus is God the Father. But he says, wait a minute. It's not mine. It's the Father's. Look at verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. Now, let me just stop right there on that term, in my name. This is an often misunderstood phrase, and it doesn't have to be. It's, it's pretty easy, actually. Uh, Brother Garrett Kirschway did a whole sermon on this a year ago where he expounded this, this term in the name of, he did a sermon called in the name of Jesus. And this becomes real important on this discussion of modalism because the Bible says that we're to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Right? That's what we're commanded to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. But the oneness teaching teaches, no, 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 you baptize in the name of Jesus only. And here's their argument. Well, what's the name of the Father? Jesus. What's the name of the Son? Jesus. What's the name of the Holy Ghost? Jesus. That's their argument. But they, they just don't even understand the term in the name of. So let's just, let's just back up the clock about 60 years. Okay. Stop in the name of love before you break my heart. So what's the name of love? Huh? What's the name of the Father? It's the name of the Holy Ghost. What's the, what's the name of love? See, they clearly don't understand what in the name of even means. When, they, when the Supreme saying stop in the name of love... What they're saying is, on the authority of love, because of love, on behalf of love. It's like this, stop in the name of the law. Isn't that what the police would yell if they're chasing you in an old movie? Stop in the name of the law. Well, what's the name of the law? <laughs> Can you tell me what that name is? And look, if I wrote a letter on behalf of three different people, let's say I'm a lawyer and I write a letter on behalf of John and James and Tom, and I said, hey, I'm writing on behalf of John, James, and Tom. You need to cease and desist what you're doing. I'm writing in the name of 
James, John, Tom, and you need to cease and desist. That doesn't mean they all have the same name, folks. Well, na name is singular. The name is the Father. The name, you know, is, is, what's the Father's name? Jesus. No, no, no. Stop in the name of love. Stop <laughs> spreading heresy in the name of love. Stop teaching lies in the name of love before you break my heart, amen? amen. <laughs> Think it over. <laughs> For crying out loud. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, this, is, this stuff's not that hard to understand. In the name of means on behalf of, by the authority of, or representing. That's what in the name of means. And so uh, what, what verse am I in? Somebody help me out. Verse 20, 26, it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will send him on my behalf. I want to send you the Comforter, so the Father is going to send the Comforter on my behalf or in my name. I want the comforter to come, so the Father's going to send him on my behalf. Right? On my behalf, on the behalf of. So it's pretty easy to understand. But Tyler Baker has been telling people, oh, when I go to Jacksonville, I'm going to baptize differently. He's going to baptize, and, and you know, he didn't want to freak people out too much. He wants to do the frog in the hot water so that they don't just see that he's just a total heretic, a oneness heretic. So he said, I'm going to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and that name is Jesus. That's what he was going to say. So look, this heresy would have come out the first Sunday anyway. The first Sunday of the church this would have come out, and a bunch of people would have moved there and gone there and joined, and, and more damage would have been done. Because you know what? If he started teaching this oneness thing, even from the first Sunday, I would have called him out as a heretic. And look, let me just make this clear. I'm not going to call people out on heretics if they disagree with me on Bible prophecy. I'm not going to call somebody out on a heretic if I disagree with their music. I'm not going to call somebody a heretic even if they preach just false doctrine. Like even if they just said, hey, drinking alcohol is fine. Just don't get drunk. I wouldn't even call that a heretic. I mean, it's false. It's wicked. It's wrong. But look, when you're going, when you're, when you're, Tampering with the Trinity, though, that's heresy. When you're tampering with salvation, the nature of God, the nature of Jesus, the nature of salvation, the nature of the Word of God, that's heresy, friend. I'm not just trying to throw that word around. And everybody's a heretic and everything's heresy. No, no, the oneness doctrine is heresy. Okay. And to sit there and say, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, and that name is Jesus, just shows you don't even understand the term in the name of in the first place. And you're teaching modalism. You're teaching oneness at that point. Okay. Now, that's a big deal. That matters. Look down at your Bible there in uh, verse number 28. <clears> hmm. <throat> Uh, it says, you've heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said I go unto the Father. All right, here's the coup de gras. For my Father is greater than I. I mean, just when you think. I mean, we've look, we could close our, we're only, we're only two-thirds of the way through the book of John. We could close our Bibles and go home a long time ago. Yeah. We could have closed our Bibles at chapter 1. But I mean, come on. We've seen evidence after evidence after evidence after evidence after evidence. And don't say, oh, these guys just didn't know. Look, I've taught the Trinity, friend. Amen. Get my sermon from two years ago. I did a sermon two years ago on the Trinity. And you know what? G get Garrett's sermon. And he heard Garrett's sermon, where, or a whole sermon. And look, Garrett was repetitive in that sermon. I didn't even go back and listen to that sermon. I did not listen to the recording. I was there a year ago. But I didn't go back and listen to the recording. And I was talking about this last night, and I said, you know, that in the name of means on behalf of, on the account of, representing. And they're like, how do you remember all the points from that sermon? And I was just thinking, like, he repeated it like 20 times. <laughs> you know, he really drove that in, that point. You know, he said, you know, uh, by the authority of, on behalf of, representing, you know. And so he really drove that in. And so there's no excuse for these people. They've been taught. They've heard this stuff. They've learned. Have they read the book of John? But yet they've gone into this heresy and they want to take as many people with them. I mean, I can't even tell you. There are tons. I didn't realize how deep it went. 
until after I put that video on YouTube, people are coming forward by the droves. Like, oh yeah, he oh yeah, we were on the way to a soul winning marathon. He to he talked to me about that the whole drive. And this guy, he was talking to me about it. And oh, that's Elliot talking to me about it. Rick talking to me about it. Tyler talking to me about it. I mean, just tons of people. They were trying to spread this junk all over the church. Go to chapter 15. Chapter 15, because we're not going to close our Bibles and go home. We're going to make it all the way to the end. John chapter 15, verse 1, I'm the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I've kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. You clearly see a chain of command. It says, my father is greater than I. I do always those things which please him. I don't do my own will. I do his will. I keep his commandments. Verse, uh, go to chapter 16. John chapter 16, verse 10. It says, of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. Verse 13, how be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Watch this. This is talking about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, the Comforter. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. How can this be true if modalism is true? If he is the Father, if he is the Son, if he's talking to himself, if he's praying to himself, then how can the Holy Spirit not speak of himself? He'll take of mine, the sons, and show it unto them. And then he goes on to say, All things that the Father hath are mine, verse 15, Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and show it unto you. A little while and ye shall not see me, and again a little while and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone. I'm not alone, because the Father is with me. I mean, can I really say that? If I, if I was playing the role of pastor, I'm not alone. The husband's with me. I'm not alone because the, the father is with me. The pastor is with me. The husband's with me. No, no, no. I couldn't say that if modalism were true. I'm not alone because the guitar player is with me. I'm not alone because the, the bass player is with me. I couldn't say that because I'm the bass player. According to them, right? It's a one-man band, they said. Because this is what he said. He said, well, the Trinity is like a three-piece band. You got one guy playing this, right? You know, and I don't think that's a good illustration of the Trinity, but that's what he said. You know, the Trinity is like one band made up of three band members, but, but he said, you know, the, 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 this is the one-man band. Well, I'm not, no way does that jive with the book of John. Not even right. close. Not even close. Verse, uh, go to chapter 17. John chapter 17 says, And now, O Father... Glorify thou me with thine own self, with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Another throwback to John 1.1, 1, 1, right? Look at verse 11, and now I'm no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. That they may be one as we are. Okay, I in them and thou in me, he talks about in this chapter. Okay, that doesn't mean that you are one and the same. Okay, go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20 says in verse 17, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Is everybody, let's just read that again. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. And look, this doesn't take away from the deity of Christ. We, we, John 1.1 1, 1 is the starting point. You need to understand John 1.1 1, 1, and then it all makes sense to you. That God is sometimes referring to the Father and sometimes it's referring to the Trinity the three that are one. Jesus is God. And look, make no bones about it. There is a mountain of evidence that Jesus is God. I mean, and that's, that's why also that's not even debated in any Baptist church because 
there's a whole, right now I'm showing you the mountain of evidence for the Trinity. Okay. I could do another sermon where I showed the mountain of evidence for the deity of Christ. Just to be, you know, there's no, que nobody's questioning the deity of Christ. What we're questioning is the Trinity versus this oneness heresy. Okay. Just to make that super clear. Verse 21 says, then said Jesus to them, peace be unto you as my father hath sent me. Even so, send I you. So that's all I had there from the book of John. But I'm going to cheat a little and go to another book that John wrote. But look, come on. I sufficiently demolished it from the book of John with four, with four pages of verses from John. Again and again and again and again. But I, I want to go to Revelation just because I want to show you how half-baked and ridiculous these foolish ideas are. And these guys, they think they're so smart, they're so puffed up, they're so arrogant, they're so full of themselves, they talk down to other people in the church, they act like you don't know the Bible, you don't study the Bible like we do, and they go down, they, they know the Bible so well, I mean, they're just such scholars that they are ready to just turn the doctrine of Christianity on its head because everybody's wrong. And except moi, just this puffed up, arrogant, prideful. So I was talking to one of these guys and he brought this out. And then I was talking to another guy who is, has been influenced these, by these guys that was kind of, he's not here tonight. He's on the fence on this doctrine. And I, I don't think he's a bad guy, but you know, so I'm, I'm not going to call him out or anything because he's on the fence. You know, let, let, him, let him pick a side. But he's, you know, he's on the fence right now. And he, you know, I was talking some sense into him and he said, I don't know. I don't know what I believe. And I said to him, I, you know, I, I, I said to him everything I'm saying to you right now. Or, or at least some of what I'm saying to you right now. And he just came back at, he, he kept bringing up this one thing. He's just like, yeah, but I just keep coming back to this thing in Revelation that, the, you know, the throne for, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm looking at Revelation 6, and I'm looking at Revelation 19, and it's just the throne. And I'm just thinking, what are you talking about? Well, last night, the same thing was coming up, where uh, a guy in the preaching class that had been approached by these guys, he said, man, they kept showing me something in Revelation about throne. And he said, Tyler himself, Tyler Baker kept showing me this thing in Revelation about the throne. And he said, I don't remember what it was because it didn't really make sense to me. It went over my head. I don't know what he's talking about, this thing with the throne. What's the throne? So we're all in the preaching class. We're trying to figure it out last night. We're, we're, we're looking up. We're Googling throne. We're, we're going to BibleGateway.com. We're typing in the word throne. We're like, okay, well, here's the verses that mention throne. We look up every verse on throne and revelation. We could not figure out what they're talking about. We're just like, I don't get it. I don't know what they're saying. So I, you know, I was, I was studying my Bible this afternoon and I'm like, man, what are they talking about? It just kind of came back to my head. So I said, you know, I'm going to call one of these guys and ask them, what, what's the throne? What's the throne thing that Tyler has been telling people? Cause I mean, this guy, I mean, this guy's a theologian. This guy's real smart. So he's, 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 I mean, I can't hold a candle, but I can try. So I'm just like, what's the throne thing? And I called one of these guys and he said, well, it's just that when you look at Revelation 6, because Revelation 6 is a pretty famous passage, right? So, you know, when you look at Revelation 6, verse 16, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. And they said, you know what? It's, it's the lamb that's sitting on that throne, they said. That's what they got out of that verse. It's the lamb that's on the throne. Okay, and then he said, and then when you look at Revelation 20, he said, when you look at Revelation 20, it says in verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Well, look, we all, I'm like, okay. But I said, are you saying that it's the lamb that's sitting on that throne? In verse 6, I said, is that what you're saying? He's like, yeah, that's what I see there. He said, yeah, Revela he said, Revelation, go back to Revelation 6, 16. 
He said, yeah, Revelation 6, 16, it's the lamb that's sitting on the throne. It says, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath is coming, who shall be able to say? And they just thought like, I mean, this was just like the coolest discovery ever. I mean, this is amazing. Okay, but why don't we just, how about we just back up just one chapter and read chapter five. What does it say in chapter five, verse one? And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Look at verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Right there. Yep. Amen. Bam! <laughs> I mean, it, I guess that's, that's what you say next when you baptize people, right? First it goes from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost to in the name of Jesus. And then it goes to just bam, 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 like Todd Bentley, right? Like Pentecostal, charismatic Todd Bentley. That's the next step. Bam, bam, bam. Friends, look at this. And you say, oh, you know, you have a bad spirit. You better know I do. When people come in here and try to start a cult and try to preach heresy and try to split our church and they lift themselves up all arrogantly and all puffed up, they're so smart. And he, quote from Tyler Baker, people should come to Jacksonville because they should go to a church that's closer to the truth than faithful word while he's on our payroll. That's what he says. Go to the one that's closer to the truth. Mr. Tyler Baker, theologian. S look, friend, is there anybody here who doesn't see what I just showed you, which is just as plain as the nose on your face, that the one who's sitting on the throne has a book in his hand and the lamb approaches and takes the book out of the hand that's, of him that sits on the throne? I mean, does anybody have any Children? Toddlers? Do we have any questions? But these guys are so foolish. They're not reading the Bible. They think, oh, reading the Bible. Look, I know for a fact, these guys have only read the Bible, some of them a handful of times. Now, Tyler Baker claims that he, he boasts of reading the Bible a multitude of times. Well, you know what? That just, that just tells me, you know, he doesn't understand the Bible. Is he even saved? How can you read the book of John as many times as you claim or read the Bible as many times as you claim? I don't, I'm afraid of you if you're even saved. I don't know. But the Bible says here in Revelation, crystal clear. But here's the thing. They're not reading chapter 5. They, they're turning to their famous passages. Chapter 6, chapter 20, and formulating half-baked, half-done, half-thought-out. You know, it's like, it's like the first time you ever read the book of John. And you're in chapter 3, and it says that, you know, Jesus is baptizing more of the people than John the Baptist. And you're like, oh, Jesus baptizes people. And then you get a couple verses later and it says, well, Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, but he himself baptized not, his disciples did it. And you're like, oh, okay, now I get, you know. It's like, it's so half-baked that it's like, it's all based on chapter six without even looking at chapter five, without even glancing. I mean, I could put, I could do like an eye test and put chapter five like this far away and, and see that it's not the lamb sitting on that throne. If I look real hard from here, I can see it from here that it's not the lamb sitting on that throne. But, that, but they want that they get in the soul winning van. Hey, kid, would you like to learn about the Trinity being a false doctrine? Hey, kid, would you like some candy? Hey, new believer. Hey, you're new to the church. Come over to our house for a barbecue. We'll tell you about the oneness. And you say, oh, you're mock. Yeah, I am. I'm taking the gloves off. These people have been, have been ripping us off and lying to us and cheating us and, 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 and abusing every privilege and just misusing the office of a deacon and, and misusing the trust placed in them. They ought to be taken to task. Amen. And you know what? If these, and you say, well, are you, are you saying they're not even saved? Look. I'm saying this, if they listen to this sermon and they still believe that crap, they're not saved. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. 
If they listen to this sermon and they still believe that crap, they're not saved. If they listen to the sermon and say, wow, I'm sorry, we were wrong, we screwed up, then I'll say, okay, maybe they were just puffed up, maybe they just got a little bit carried away. I mean, right, I mean, and look, I, I, I'm okay with people having different opinions about this because it's, it's hard to say what's going on with these people. Are they just Judases? Are they just foolish? Are they just arrogant? And look, I don't know, who, agree, I, I, and look, I'm not trying to put any pressure on anybody. Just, just, just be honest with me because it's okay to have a different opinion. I mean, who thinks that if they listen to this sermon and they still believe this crap that they're not saved? Who, th who thinks? Who's leaning that way? I mean, that's, that's, that's where I'm leaning. You know, and I, and I, see, I've never really had to ask myself this question before because the only people I've ever had in the last, let's see, I've been soul winning now for 18 years, the last 18 years of soul winning, the only people I've ever had confront me with this oneness thing or this Jesus only was people who were coming to me and, and, and they were, they were like a hardcore Pentecostal, so they weren't even close to being right on the gospel. So I never thought of like, what if a saved person believes in oneness? Like that thought never came to my mind because I just never ran into it. So this is like a new thing to me. Like, I mean, I know if people deny the deity of Christ, they're for sure not saved. But it's like just saved people believing in oneness doctrine, modalism? It's new to me. So I'm just kind of taken aback by it. And I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how this could happen. How could it happen? Now, if they come and say, hey, we were wrong, we screwed up, we're at false doctrine, you know, then I would say, okay, maybe they just got carried away, maybe they're just being foolish, maybe they're... But the way they went about it, they snuck around, I don't know. It's weird. It's premeditated, you know. But I'll tell you this, though. If, they, if, if anyone who's cast out repents, they can always come back. But let me say this. They're not going to be teaching anyone anything. They're not going to be put in preaching positions. They're never going to be ordained as, any, as a janitor. You know, and, and, they're not, and they're not going to be teaching in our ministries or preaching because these guys have need that one teach them again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And are such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. These guys are not qualified. At be, a best case scenario, these guys are not qualified to teach anyone. They shouldn't be teaching. They're puffed up, vainly puffed up in their minds and have uh, formulated strange and diverse doctrines. And listen, if you have any questions about the Trinity, if you have any questions about this doctrine, if you have any questions about these things, come see me after the service. I will not rip your head off unless you're a oneness. <laughs> then I will rip your head off. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, come see me after service. If you have a question, I'll be glad to talk to you and have a civil discussion with you. But I don't think anybody in here... I'd be surprised if people have a lot of questions after the sermon. I, th I think it's pretty clear. I mean, and, you know, you could ask me. You could ask Brother Gary. You could ask Brother Segura. You could ask other men in the church. I mean, it's not. You could, you could probably ask a little child. Ask my daughter after the sermon. Ask my, ask my, ask my uh, four-year-old. But anyway, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you so much for um, all of the, the, the clarity that you give, Lord, and, and we pray that you would help us all to study, to show ourselves approved and to learn more and, and to, to not get puffed up, Lord. Help us not to get arrogant and come up with strange, diverse doctrines, Lord. Help us to uh, put our nose to the grindstone, work hard and study hard and, and read every chapter and read carefully and, and, and do diligence, Lord, to, uh, to, to, to make sure that we're doctrinally sound and that we're a workman that needed not to be ashamed, Lord, because a, a workman that doesn't rightly divide the word of truth, he needs to be ashamed. And so help us to study, Lord, and we thank you so much for the amazing uh, uh, nature, Lord, that you teach us in the Bible of the Trinity. And uh, we just thank you so much for salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Song 132. Song 132. Never Alone, Song 132. 